AMD's Athlon 3000G CPU targets the ultra-budget market, which is one of our favorites to work with for the creativity required to get a good build together. The Athlon 3000G is a two-core, four-thread CPU with a base clock of 3.5 GHz, no boost clock offered. The CPU is fully unlocked, a trend set accidentally by MSI for its B350 Tomahawk BIOS for the Athlon 200GE last year. This means that overclocking to 4 GHz should be common, and thanks to the lack of turbo, should actually improve performance meaningfully. Today, we're focusing strictly on this product as a low-end gaming CPU for pairing with a discrete GPU. Before that, this video is brought to you by Be Quiet and its Straight Power 11 series power supplies. The Straight Power 11 PSUs ship from 450 watts up to 1000 watts, accommodating most of the gaming PC build requirements you'd encounter, and focuses on delivering a higher quality power supply that doesn't sacrifice on efficiency or stability. Noise is also a heavy point for the Straight Power 11, using a 135mm Silent Wings 3 fan that can spin as low as 200 RPM for quieter low load operation. Learn more at the link in the description below. The Athlon 3000G is a $50 CPU, and again, we find that segment really fun to work with because it, it genuinely does take a bit more creativity to get together a really cheap build that's also not using total garbage tier components for things like the motherboard or the power supply, where it's often the easiest to go really cheap and then potentially regret it later. So it's more fun to build with these cheaper parts because you start looking at the high end and it, it kind of gets easy. You just sort by max on price and add to cart, add to cart, add to cart. Okay, you're done. So this one, this is built on 14 nanometer process. It is not Zen 2 architecture, it's Zen Plus. And the CPU is AM4 compatible. It's on all the same chipsets you already know, but there's one note here, which is that X570, although you uh, obviously shouldn't ever pair it with that anyway, but if for some reason you ended up with the free X570 board and you needed a $50 CPU to go with it, then most of those boards will not support the CPU. We noticed that when we were testing it. And typically the X470, B450, those boards will have support. You just need to check on a board by board basis and make sure that they have the CPU on their supported CPUs lists. And that's just something you should know and, and do before buying it. But anyway, it's old process is the point and kind of older architecture. It's not the absolute newest. It's not Zen 2. And the CPU does include, however, an IGP in the form of Vega 3, and it's got three Vega, uh, Vega architecture CUs. So that'll put you at 192 stream processors. It's super low end as a graphic solution, 1100 megahertz, three CUs. You end up with something that can sort of do 720p and maybe some really lightweight 1080p workloads. And that's just, we're not really interested in that, to be honest. We're focused on, okay, how is this thing as a, just a CPU with a discrete GPU added? Because a $50 CPU in an ultra budget gaming build, you start looking at $50 CPU and then maybe $70, $100 GPU, something like that, and you get a really cheap, complete solution for the two major silicon components. So that's what we're interested in. That's what we're testing today. If you wanted the IGP, it's mostly useful for things like HTPC is where you need some basic video processing, like video actual graphics uh, solution in there. You just need something to drive display out, but you also don't want to use Intel or something like that. And Intel's Pentium G line is not anywhere close to the prices it should be because of their 14 nanometer shortage anyway. So that does sort of leave the Athlon 3000G in an interesting spot where Intel should be and typically is, but is not presently occupying, at least not in a competent fashion. So let's get through the review. Again, we are focusing on this as a standalone CPU. If you were to buy a low-end DGPU with it, what we're going to do is show you where does performance cap out relative to the other CPUs on the market. We've got some 3200G and 3400G numbers in here as well with them coupled with DGPUs. So none of these are using IGPs today. We're going to start with a lighter weight game to illustrate where the 3000G is best suited. This CPU is really meant for games like maybe Fortnite or Rocket League or similar games that are typically classified as quote esports titles, but obviously it can do more than that. F1 at 1080p will give us an idea for the upper bounds of performance in a simpler title, but we still get to see the scaling of the hierarchy against other CPUs. After all, a lot of this is about CPU to CPU scaling more so than it is absolute performance. The Athlon 3000G holds 139 FPS average when stock, and that sounds like a lot, and it is strictly from a stance of establishing that a $50 CPU is capable of high frame rate in the right type of game, but it's obviously much weaker against the rest of the stack. 
the previous worst performer tested that's remotely close in performance would be something like the R5 1600, which manages 43% higher frame rate and more consistent frame times. The AMD R5 1600 is about $100 on Amazon these days, down from its original price of about $190, and the R5 2600 is $115. These are worth the competitive pricing, definitely, but an increase in price of $60 is a lot for some people. It's not as easy as just spending $60 more. And for those unable to justify the extra expense or afford the extra expense, the 3000G is at least able to play this game with a good frame rate while being, for those builds, affordable. Overclocking the AMD 3000G gets it to 152 FPS average when at 4 GHz, allowing a boost to performance of 9.4%. That's not bad for about 5 minutes of work. Still not great, but not bad. And when we say not great, we're really referring to the comparative scaling against the stack. Obviously, 152 FPS is more than enough for a game like this. For comparison, the AMD R3 3200G 4-core 4 4-thread 4 part runs the same test at about 143 FPS average, which isn't a meaningful uplift from the 3000G stock. The 3400G runs at 156 FPS average, at which point you should definitely just buy a DGPU and a cheap CPU unless you have a specific need for the more powerful IGP on the 3400G. Let's take a look at the frame times to better understand the consistency of delivery on this 2-core 4-thread CPU. As a reminder, frame time plots give us a frame-to-frame -frame look at the time required to generate each new frame, measured in frame-to-frame -frame intervals and dubbed frame times by Scott Wasson, formerly of Tech Report. Lower is better, but more consistent is best. The 3000G isn't bad overall, although it doesn't counter spikes that manifest as slight hitches occasionally. We found that excursions from the mean greater than 8 to 12 milliseconds will often be detectable by the player, and what happens a handful of times across some of our test passes is exactly that, excursions from the mean that become noticeable. We're plotting three of them here, three different test passes uh, out of four, all showing occasional spikes. It's fine overall, but not perfectly fluid. The fact that we don't encounter many spikes north of 15 milliseconds is a good sign, though. As for 1440p performance, predictably, it's unchanged. The game isn't GPU-bound at 1440p on the Athlon 3000G. We're clearly in a CPU-bound scenario, and that'll be true for pretty much all modern cards that cost more than $70 to $100 when working with this specific CPU. Hitman 2 shows the opposite side of things using a more intensive game. For this one, the CPU is struggling to keep up at 1080p, and obviously 1440 is the same thing. The 3000G at 1080p holds 47 FPS average, allowing the R5 1600 a lead of about 80%. The R3 1200 would be closer to the 3000G, although we haven't retested this aged CPU yet. 47 FPS average isn't bad for a $50 part, but it's not particularly enjoyable either. The good news is that we test Hitman 2 with fairly CPU intensive settings that we picked for higher end parts than this one, so with some reduction of simulation quality, the CPU would be able to hit the 60 FPS mark. It just takes some extra effort and tuning on behalf of the user. Overclocking the Athlon 3000G didn't help in this particular title, unfortunately, and it appears that we're more thread-bound than we are frequency-bound. The overclock to 4 GHz only gained us 5.7% uplift, or about 2.7 FPS average, so hardly noticeable for most people. For comparison to other low-end AMD CPUs, the Athlon R3 3200G with a DGPU was maxing out at 50 FPS average, with the 3400G at 60 FPS average, both of which exhibited similarly poor 0.1% lows as the 3000G, although this title also has some issues with those in general. At 1440p, because we're CPU bound still, the Hitman 2 results are within test variants of the original chart, so there's really nothing more to talk about here. Looking at a newer game next, Shadow of the Tomb Raider gives us our second DX12 title of the three shown so far, which means that draw calls on the CPU should be reduced by removing API abstraction layers. At 1080p, the Athlon 3000G manages 53 FPS average. It's actually pretty good, but its frame time performance is spikier than desirable at 26 FPS 0.1% lows on average. Versus other cheaper parts like the R5 1600, frame time consistency is significantly worse on the Athlon CPU. The end result is that the player will encounter some stutters and hitches during gameplay, something that can only partially be accounted for with graphics tuning. Overclocking pushes to 58 FPS average and 30 FPS 0.1% lows, which is an improvement in average frame rate of about 9.4%. It seems that a 9% uplift is potentially going to be the common gain from an overclock on this. Adding $60 to the bill would get you 106 FPS average on the R5 1600, but it'd probably be better at that point to do the $70 increase and push to the newer R5 2600, 
with its 116 FPS average. Our next benchmark is Civilization 6 with its turn time benchmarking. This gives us another perspective on CPU performance, allowing us to see how CPU bound game simulations perform. The Athlon 3000G stock CPU requires 73 seconds to complete a single AI player turn. With five AI players in the game, that puts us at six minutes to do a full pass around the AI before you get to take your next turn. That's painfully slow, obviously, and pales in comparison to every other CPU on the chart. Even the R53400G and R33200G do significantly better at 52.8 seconds for the $87 R33200G. That's a turn time reduction of 27% in exchange for the extra $37. Now, if we use percentages for everything, that's a disproportionate increase in spending, but percentages are kind of funny stat math sometimes and could misrepresent things. Either way, though, you're at about a 74% increase in money for the performance gained, but it's a meaningful and noticeable uplift in performance, so it might be worth it for some. That said, part of the money would be wasted if you're not intending to use the IGP on the higher-end APUs. The Athlon, it's more of a throw-in. It doesn't really count. Overclocking the Athlon 3000G gets it to 64.5 seconds, a reduction of 11%. For comparison, the R5 1600 runs at 45 seconds per turn in exchange for its $100 pricing, a reduction of 38% from the baseline stock 3000G part. The campaign benchmark for Total War Warhammer 2 has the AMD Athlon 3000G at a completely reasonable 85 FPS average. This is in combination with consistent frame time pacing and making the Athlon part a good fit for ultra budget builds for the Total War Games campaign mode. Overclocking the 4 GHz pushes the result by an impressive 15%, up to 97 FPS average and 60 FPS 0.1% lows. The 3200G and 3400G both run closer to 100 FPS average, but given that money is wasted if the IGP isn't used, the 3000G comes away looking better for its price in this game. 1440p, unsurprisingly, changes nothing, as the CPU is still the bottleneck for this benchmark. The campaign is only half of a Total War game. For the rest, we need the battle benchmark. The top of the battle benchmark charts runs up against GPU bottlenecks, but we have plenty of test resolution to see how the 3000G performs. The Athlon 3000G supports a baseline of 78 FPS average here, with the lows reasonably spaced at 39 for 0.1%, and with the overclock pushing us to a well-supported 88 FPS average. That's an uplift of 12% from just a few minutes of overclocking, so not bad. Altogether, the performance of the 3000G allows the R5 1600 stock CPU to lead the stock 3000G by about 59%, which is overall okay for the price delta. The game ends up playable on the 3000G, and that's really the ultimate goal of a super cheap budget class CPU. Assassin's Creed has us at 47 FPS average, with lows down in the gutter at 25 FPS 0.1%. Performance in this game is overall bad, and we'd advise against using the 3000G for a title like this, or a game on the same engine. Assassin's Creed wants more cores, and that really shows here. For Assassin's Creed, just to illustrate the point, here's a frame time plot with the AMD Athlon 3000G. Frame times get as high as the upper 30s here, with average frame time pacing bouncing around between 28 milliseconds and 15 milliseconds at the better end of it. This experience has a few stutters and an overall slow frame rate, and as you can see here with the time for each frame to be generated, it's really not a fast CPU. Looking at an older game last, Grand Theft Auto V establishes a baseline performance for the stock configuration at 54 FPS average, which is overall good for the $50 part in a CPU heavy load. Remember, we intentionally load the CPU hard with these tests because they were built for higher end products. So 54 FPS average with that configuration is not so bad. You could tune settings down to improve this easily to the 60 FPS mark. The 3400G ends up at 62 FPS average stock, but again, you're wasting that money without the IGP in use, so it's better to just buy an R5 2600 or something instead. The 3200G also runs about 62 FPS average, which is reasonable at $87. The upgrade is about 16% uplift for 37 bucks, so whether or not that's justifiable will depend on your budget specifically. That'll cap it for this one. We kept it pretty simple. It's a crazy time of year right now anyway, so we wanted to just keep the scope narrow enough to focus on the thing that we're most interested in using the CPU for. And as far as conclusions go, the Athlon 3000G is a good enough processor. At $50, it's hard to make a lot of demands, and our test suite is designed to use more CPU-intensive settings. So there are some games in here like Assassin's Creed where we just probably wouldn't really recommend getting your hopes up playing it with a great frame rate in general with the CPU. 
But some of the other games, you can bring settings down and improve things a bit, like Hitman 2 as an example. Now, uh, game testing isn't about absolutes. It's not about how does this CPU perform in these specific games. It's about relatives and hierarchies and scale. And what we learn is that the scale is about 60 to 80% benefit by moving to something like an R5 1600 for $100. But a doubling of your cost for the CPU for a lot of people is, is not a feasible thing. So it's easy to say you could spend just 50, just 60, just 70 to more dollars and get a way better solution. And that's true. But the just part is not necessarily just. It's not, not only $50 for a lot of people who are using these types of parts. And it has nothing necessarily to do with a person's wealth overall, but about their budget for builds. And the Athlon 3000G is a really good part to use for specific like home theater builds or low end. You just need kind of a decent desktop computer, maybe throw a DGPU in there. Something that's not supposed to be fancy or high powered or focused on more than 1080p and some lightweight games. So that's really where this CPU shines. At $50, we think it's a great option for the ultra budget class. And obviously, we'd recommend upgrading it if you can find a bit more money. And if you do want to have a better overall gaming experience where you're not so CPU constrained as with this. And there will be games occasionally that just won't let this CPU launch those games. That happens sometimes with two core, four thread configurations these days. So just be prepared for that, but otherwise it does fine. It's not impressive, but it's also, for its price, it's, it's pretty damn good. So we're okay with it where it is. This is definitely, in our opinion, one of the best budget CPUs right now, by which we mean ultra, truly ultra budget. Uh, next competitors would be $87, 3200G, which is eh, not super worth it as an upgrade from this, unless you want to use the IGP, in which case, it's cheaper in a combined sense. And then there's also the R3 series, R3 1200, 1300X, stuff like that. But those aren't, those maybe $60, $70, depending on where you look, what region you're in. So anyway, that's it. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to our best CPUs roundup for help in finding a CPU appropriate for your uses as you work towards a PC build for end of year. And you can go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly, like by buying our shirts, mod mats, mugs, toolkits, and other items. We'll see you all next time.